The island of Crete was taken from the possession of the Byzantine Empire by a group of Muslim Andalusian exiles in the 820s. The Byzantines attempted to reclaim the island with four previous naval invasions, but these expeditions failed at great expense. The most recent of these expeditions occurred in 949, in the reign of Constantine VII. Generally speaking, they had failed due to a lack of overwhelming strength on land, poor leadership, or external Arab naval interference. The Emirate of Crete was a real threat to the Empire, both in terms of their sponsored and permitted piratical actions, and because they grew bold, sacking cities and defeating imperial navies. In 904, for example, the second city of the Empire, Thessaloniki, was sacked by a surprise naval assault. The final Byzantine response would begin after Nicephorus Phocas was promoted to the rank of domestic of the schools. In 956, the harbour of Tarsus was stormed by Byzantine marines. The Tarsic fleet in the suburbs of the city, meaning the city which lay outside the walls, were burnt to the ground. The destruction of the Tarsic fleet gave an opportunity for another expedition to take Crete. Romanus II decided to continue pursuing his father Constantine's project, and Nicephorus Phocas was placed in charge of the largest expedition yet in 960, as the fifth time will surely be the charm. For this video, Leo the Deacon will be providing most of our detail as a contemporary to the event. John Skylitzes covers the siege far more briefly, but his outline generally agrees with Leo's work. Setting sail in early summer, the fleet of perhaps 40,000 sailors and soldiers arrived on July 13th, 960 AD. Byzantine naval expeditions usually have soldiers to sailors in the ratio of 1 to 4, so there should be about 8,000 soldiers to 32,000 sailors. That really is quite the logistical tale compared to land invasions in the Middle Ages, and goes part of the way to explaining why previous expeditions had failed. Quote, he displayed indeed the experience that he had in military affairs, for he had brought ramps with him on the transport ships, which he set up on the beach, and thus transferred the army, fully armed and mounted, from the sea to dry land. The barbarians were amazed at this strange and novel sight, but stayed assembled in place and maintained their close formation, unbroken, to await the Roman assault against them. End quote. Arrayed in three columns, Nicephorus drove the Cretans off the beach and back to the main city of Chandax. He set the Roman camp in front of the main city of Chandax and moved his fleet to a safe harbour, detailing his warships to blockade the port of Chandax and, quote, if they should see any barbarian transport ship sailing out, they were to pursue it and incinerate it with liquid fire. This is the Greek fire that the Byzantines are famous for. Nicephorus organised a small Roman detachment of picked men sent to raid and reconnoitre the island. He informed them to remain vigilant and sober. Instead, they became drunk and were ambushed by a Cretan force. Despite being, quote, unsteady on their feet, these men resisted for a while until their leader was killed and they fled, sustaining high casualties. Nicephorus admonished these men for their folly and worked faster on his plans to secure his army from unexpected ambushes. Chandax had thick walls on three sides and the ocean on the fourth. On the side opposite the sea, the walls were built on top of a flat and level rock. The walls themselves were thick enough to move two wagons side by side and had two extremely wide and deep moats around them. These moats may have been filled or partially filled with water as Chandax is a port city. However, Leo the Deacon is silent on this matter. On realising that the city could not be breached quickly, Nicephorus built his own circumvallating wall, complete with ditch and stakes, so that he could dictate when any engagements would occur. Having secured himself from the city, Nicephorus could split his forces to then secure himself from the rest of the island. Nicephorus secretly set out from his camp with a detachment during the night. A Cretan camp was discovered, and Nicephorus attacked them during the following night, wiping them out. The Cretan heads were mounted on spikes in front of the town with calls for surrender. The citizens of Chandax resisted still, and Nicephorus launched an assault on the walls. Despite using trebuchets to suppress the defenders on the walls, the defenders were able to repulse the assault with thrown rocks, spears, and, quote, arrows fell like snowflakes in winter. Nicephorus pulled back rather than destroy his own army and settled down to starve out the town, whilst building more siege weapons 
and importantly training his army with daily exercises and skirmishing practice. It was a very cold winter, and Nicephorus worked hard on the soldiers' discipline to ensure that his men would endure the resulting famine. Come spring, another assault was launched. On the 6th of March, the army advanced with heavy infantry on its edges. The army pressed forwards and a battering ram was brought up to a section of the walls. The stone throwing of the trebuchets now kept the Cretans in check, and all the while this distraction allowed a group of men to begin undermining the walls. You see, where the moat joined the walls, the ground was sandy, and men with stone chipping tools began digging. As the ground was hollowed out, wooden props were added to support the weight of the walls. Additional kindling was brought and a fire was eventually set. Two towers in the intervening section of wall collapsed and the town was successfully stormed. This method of prop and burn is supported by the Tactica of Nicephorus Uranos, who was uh, writing in the 990s, if I'm not mistaken. Nicephorus Uranus describes it as the only method for storming cities, and it is used several times by Nicephorus Phocus in the conquest of both Crete and Cilicia. Nicephorus prevented his soldiers from slaughtering the defenceless citizens or those Cretan soldiers who had surrendered. He set aside one sixth of the money for the treasury, some money for his own first spoils, and several high ranking captives, such as Anemas, the emir's son, who would eventually convert to Christianity and die fighting at the siege of Dorostolon in 970 to 971. The rest of the city was given over for the soldiers to sack. After securing the island, Nicephorus would celebrate a triumph in the Hippodrome for his conquests, surrounded by his treasures of gold, silver and purple. By securing Crete in 961, and then Cilicia and Cyprus in 965, Nicephorus had made the Aegean into a Byzantine lake, safe from all forms of piratical actions. The Byzantine conquest of Crete would hold until the Fourth Crusade in 1204.